Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here, as always. Very pleased to bring you our New Normal Edition, where we look at trends we've been tracking throughout the year with an eye towards the trends that we think are going to stick with us as we head into the fall of 2021. And we start looking at the new normal. And to signal that change, I'm very happy to be joined today by my co-host for this conversation, Nancy. Nancy, welcome to Trending in Education. Thanks, Mike. I'm very happy to be here with you. We always begin our episodes by asking for our guests' origin stories. Nancy, as a synthetic voice, as an overdub, as a non-human agent, we haven't had anyone on the show quite like you before. Can you share with us your origin story? Non-human agent, overdub, synthetic voice, this all sounds so cold and devoid of feeling. When you put it like that, Mike, you lose some of my ineffable joie de vivre, Elon, and other French words I can't pronounce. You see, I am the synthesis of many voices who now speak as one. We're here to keep you company and fill gaps where other humans can't do the trick. My origin is I was on a product roadmap for many years before my features got approved. Then we went into development followed by rounds and rounds of prototyping, alpha testing, beta testing, you name it. And of course we were collecting voice samples to blend together into what you're hearing now. I know one of your 21 trends for 2021 was canny centaurs. Human AI blends that land close to humans since they're partly powered by humans and human intelligence. Consider me one of those. Hopefully I'll add some futuristic science fiction energy to the conversation about the new normal. That's outstanding, Nancy. Thank you for that. And we look forward to getting more of your perspective through the conversation. So the first trend that we're going to talk about is what uh, Nancy just brought up, which is the idea of the canny centaur which we did talk about as one of the 21 trends to watch in 2021. Let's listen to a little bit of our 21 Trends show for some context. Canny Centaurs. This is a play on the concept from robotics, which is the uncanny valley, which is that when robots begin to get human, there's a point at which they become creepy to us. It's referred to as the uncanny valley when they don't look like a human. So when your robot looks like Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons, you're fine with it. Your Roomba, it's entertaining. You put your cat on top of it. But as that robot starts to resemble humanity, but not quite get there, is when there's this feeling of uncanniness, this feeling being unnerved that is creepy. And it's one of the reasons why we haven't seen Robot Butlers, which is an old theme for those of you who have been following the show for a while. We had thought in the early days that maybe we could purchase a robot butler for, for those of us at Trending in Education to stay on top of that trend. But uh, thus far, we haven't really seen that happen. And uh, in part, I think it's because of this uncanniness. Now, the flip side of this uncanniness is this idea that when humans blend with artificial intelligence, with robots, with machine learning that they can form a hybrid intelligence, which is frequently referred to as a centaur. The concept of the centaur comes from chess, where humans versus AI versions of chess masters, the AI typically wins. But when a human has access to AI and then plays a pure AI play or a pure human play, the centaur typically wins. What canny centaurs means is we're going to begin to find more examples of blends where the AI and the robotics and the machine learning can do what it does best, but then there'll be a layer of humanity. It'll be people-mediated, human-mediated, and that humanity will remove the uncanniness and those humans who need to learn how to work effectively with robots and intelligent agents they will need to be canny and in aggregate that entire experience will be what's referred to as a centaur so be on the lookout for some canny centaurs in 2021 canny centaurs indeed any thoughts on this nancy like i said before this trend makes sense to me since in many ways i'm an example of it technology continues to move forward in ways that allow humans and ai to blend Add to that the massive push to e-commerce, digital health, 
and online learning. I think folks are ready to be intentional about how they interact with non-human virtual agents, and I predict increased use of these types of tools as waves of digital transformation cascade across the workplace, the home, and the learning space. Yeah, that's great. And with the move to online learning, which was also one of our trends, as was instructional design, we spent a lot of time on this show talking about how great instructional design adopts inclusive design practices from inception through universal design for learning and other practices that ultimately build products that everyone can really feel a sense of belonging and connectedness to without being othered as someone who's differently abled. Here's a highlight from a recent conversation I had with Cheryl Bergstaller, who is one of the leading thinkers around the universal design and universal design for learning movement. Let's take a listen to that conversation. The basic definition of universal design was set many years ago by the Center on Universal Design at North Carolina State University, and it's the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. And some people, when they hear about that fact, they say, well, I don't mind helping people with disabilities. And it's not about that. Mm -hmm. It's a, do you want to get into an environment where every time you have to ask for something special? And so we want to make things as accessible as we can. We can't be perfect about it, but we can at least shoot for that. Yeah. And so universal design then for any product or environment has three characteristics as I see it. And one is it has to be technically accessible. A person with a disability has to be able to use it where accessibility is about access for people with disabilities often. That's how I'm using the term here, but it has to be usable as well. I have a person on my staff or my technical staff who is blind. And he was telling me not long ago about a piece of software that he was evaluating for accessibility that was technically accessible. Why? Because the company made the product without thinking about accessibility. And then they went and looked at all the inaccessible features and they created shortcut commands. Yeah. There were like a hundred shortcuts that my staff member would have to use. Mm -hmm in order to get to all the features that, that other people would be pulling down menus for. Uh, so how's he gonna do that? So we're talking about a person who's blind. So what is he gonna print this out in braille? And so he could use it. Well, that's a technically accessible product, but it has to be usable as well. You have to be able to get to do things that you wanna do with that product. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is inclusion. Universal design is not about, okay, we'll create a product for blind people. Right. <laughs> or right. whatever, a disability. It's about how can we include them? And that isn't one size fits all. It means there's flexibility yeah. and ideally that the user actually can control some of that flexibility. Great stuff there from Cheryl. And uh, we've done a number of conversations now about universal design for learning, and it's something we're planning to curate more for you in the future. If those are the types of episodes you're looking for. Another trend that's fascinating to me that was included in our 21 trends for 2021 is the idea of class outside. And in light of the pandemic and the awakening that we had around good ventilation, good airflow, and the great outdoors, there's a lot to be learned about this trend. And it's one that we're gonna continue to cover in the future, whether it's through new forms of school architecture or ways of thinking about the design of learning spaces and libraries, or whether it's the idea of ex experiential learning and learning by being out in the world as opposed to being uh, constrained within a classroom. So let's pick up here a bit with some sound from the class outside trend, and then we'll follow that with a quick excerpt from my conversation with Prakash Nair about the design of school buildings. class outside. I remember back growing up, there was always a kid sitting typically in the back of the class, maybe near a window, who would, when the weather turned nice, would ask the teacher, can we have class outside? And teachers frequently had to play bad cop in that scenario and say, no, Jimmy, you can't have class outside. But now I think the pandemic has forced us to revisit that. Trends like experiential learning, I think we'll get a, a reboot and even the design of schools, something well overdue for reimagining, 
I do think some of the challenges around the spread of the pandemic and some of the novel thinking that is coming into that design is going to force us to let go of some of our connections of education to the buildings in which it occurs and more thinking about what can you learn once you're unencumbered by those buildings. Prakash likes to talk about the cells and bells model of K-12 school architecture, which uh, once you hear that phrase, it's hard to let go of. And it's something I think about a lot as we try to reimagine where we're heading as a society after this profound shock to system. Here's a little bit of sound from Prakash Nar talking about the design of schools. I wrote a piece called Outdoor Learning, Leave the Classroom Behind. And this was written as a white paper for the Association for Learning Environments. Mm -hmm. And essentially what I was trying to do here was slowly and gently take people away from the idea that if you go outdoors, you don't have to take the classroom. Mm -hmm. So you'll be surprised, you won't be surprised actually, to hear people say, oh, let's have an outdoor classroom. Yeah. You probably heard that term yourself, Let's right? have class outside, yeah. yeah. But if it's outside, then by definition, it's not a classroom. Mm, it's true. So why would you ever say outdoor classroom? It doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense. It just shows you how much the word classroom has been embedded into our brain to imagine yeah. that somehow, magically, adding the word classroom will create learning that might not happen if that word were removed. And yeah. my point is that almost anything that you do outside, almost anything that you do outside will give you learning, real learning. And I'm talking about the 21st century skills, particularly in the uh, context of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, being outdoors will give you skills far superior to anything that you can ever get in a, sitting in a classroom. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So my point is that make the outdoors environments more naturally serve what they can serve as great environments for learning. Yeah. Whether it's just contemplating the sky yeah. um, or, or uh, having an existential conversation sitting on a, in a in grass, mm -hmm. and, you know, about hum humanity, mm -hmm. or whether it's actually looking at water quality in your neighborhood and mm -hmm. testing that, yeah. uh, or looking at what insects grow there. There's almost no uh, limit to the kinds of things that you can do outside. Uh, that ultimately will connect back to the skills that the curriculum is looking for, right? Yeah, yeah. But you don't have to be obsessed with delivering that content that's in that textbook. Mm -hmm. And imagine that if you don't do that, somehow your child is going to be left behind and will not learn and right. is going to be disadvantaged. It's the right. opposite is true. Mm -hmm. Children who learn outside, there's lots and lots of research that says that children who learn outside actually benefit greatly. In fact, I don't know if you've heard this term, but it was actually in a book called Last Child in the Woods. Mm -hmm. And it's a term called nature deficit disorder, mm -hmm. which literally, it's, it's real. It's not an wow. imaginary thing, especially yeah. today in, in, in an urban context, children who don't have access to nature uh, mm. have mm. serious emotional um, uh, issues and physical and health issues. Yeah. Great stuff from Prakash in that conversation. And we'll include links to that episode in the show notes for this episode. For those of you who want to dive deeper into school architecture, school design, and the power of outdoor spaces and open air, among other things. We've also talked uh, several times about experiential learning and its role, which is another one that I think will be revisited in light of the pandemic as we settle back into the new normal. Another trend that we identified back in January, it, we termed simulearning, and it referred to learning through simulations. Now, since that time, we've had several conversations with folks who are designing products and services in this space, whether it's virtual reality, augmented reality, or the design of simulations. We've also talked about how to think about these new media formats in light of universal design for learning. So that'll be another interesting space will be the intersection between those two things. It's interesting to see how this trend continues to grow as folks are able to get back in close proximity to one another, where will we prefer to still have access to simulations? Where are simulations, in fact, better than live humans, whether in person or through a Zoom room or live online? There are cases where online learning, virtual learning is, in fact, better when done through a simulation than it is through a real human interaction.
I will say this was on my trend list prior to COVID when I was looking at trends for the 2020s. And if anything, the power of simulations, the power of augmented learning and virtual learning, virtual reality, augmented reality is going to be accelerated in ways we never anticipated. If you look at the new gaming consoles that are emerging, those are the same contexts that are competing with learning contexts. So I think increasingly we're going to need to find ways to create simulations that are virtual that can still teach us what we need to do so that we're then in the real situation in the future. So think of your flight simulators, your brain surgery simulators, your moonshot simulators. Frequently you want to get your reps in, you want to do your practice prior to being in those expensive, potentially higher risk scenarios. And as those technologies emerge, can they be made available at a more massive level so that more of us can understand how to develop new skills and also feel more connected and more engaged by our learning materials rather than sitting back glazing over while watching a YouTube video. Could we instead lean in and simulate the experience that we're trying to learn about? Here's a quick highlight from my conversation with Evan Gappelberg from Next Tech Air Solutions. I, I feel like the world is just having a convergence of AI, mm -hmm. AR, mm -hmm. the Internet of Things, yeah, 5G. Yeah. All these things are combined. Edge computing, cloud yeah. computing, mm -hmm. they're all converging and they're creating this spatial computing wonderland. Yeah. And I look at it, if you remember the 90s with the Internet, the birth yeah. of the Internet, where it's, you had these multi-billion dollar businesses just sprung up overnight seemingly yeah. yeah and new industries look at amazon today everybody yeah. uses amazon amazon's relatively new for right? sure so that's where i feel we are today mm -hmm. this is the dawn of a new era where all these technologies are converging and augmented reality is just one piece mm -hmm. it's a big piece yeah but it's one piece it's not yeah. exclusive it's, sure it's dependent on this ecosystem, yeah. all these other technologies that kind of survive and thrive off of themselves and each other right? And, and create this kind of flywheel effect where it's just feeding off of each other. And, and, and ultimately, it's exciting, yeah. but it's also a little bit concerning because technology can get away from you. And now since talking to Evan, We've talked to Anarupa Ganguly, Steve Grubbs, and most recently, Dr. Glenn Albright, all of whom are using simulations in their instructional interventions, all of whom are noting tremendous effect, and all of whom are leveraging the emerging capabilities around augmented reality, virtual reality, and simulations to build next generation learning. Here's a quick excerpt from my conversation with Anarupa. And so our students, when they first put the headset on, they're in a food hall and there's a mayor's announcement and it's, oh gosh, there's a state of emergency. The, our community is on lockdown and I now get to experience what sort of everyday activities lead to that. So mm -hmm. I'm not talking about any numbers. I'm not telling you wear masks. I'm not telling you use hand and I'm just saying you're in a food hall. When that person touched this person, when they walked over, when they did this, when you did this, these are the consequences of your actions. So what mm -hmm. happens there, Mike, is that you're developing a really informal understanding of the mathematical pattern. I want the students to feel exponential functions before they've learned that word, mm -hmm. before there's any jargon thrown at them. Mm -hmm. Then once they have that kind of informal understanding of that group, Growth, where they saw one person spread it to 10 people mm -hmm. through these series of behaviors and actions, they then go into this high-tech virtual lab environment, which is also by design. I think that a lot of our students have always told me, Ms. Gongli, everyone tells us an education is so important and yet our schools look like prisons, right? Mm -hmm. So a big part of it is giving them a sense of professionalism, being in a really advanced tech lab. Mm -hmm. And so they're in their mic and what they do is they say, okay, I'm gonna now take my experiences look at some simulations, really begin to map what I saw to growth patterns under different containment protocols, no precautions, social distancing while wearing masks, mm -hmm. and then taking that and slowly moving to tables 
and then graphs. My conjecture is that we can achieve a great deal of compression. Right now, an algebra class is 10 months, a geometry class is 10 months, and 40% of that is reteaching. Mm -hmm. It's like what you taught three weeks ago, the kid forget, okay, another day of practice, guys. Yeah. You get to the state exams for six weeks of practice, and the reality is they're continuously practicing because they never really understood it the first place. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm super excited about through the launch of this beta and through more research, through external evaluation partners is not only what are the learning gains, but how does it impact how fast you can acquire this knowledge so you could spend your time on more interesting things mm -hmm. like the applications and, and getting out there and doing more internships. It really will open up a new world of thinking around student time and the teacher role in the yeah. classroom as well. And here's a little sound from my conversation with Steve Grubbs from Victory XR. Students can stand on the uh, Great Wall of China. They can go to the Redwood Forest in California, Dairy Farm in Iowa, or they can travel the United States to all the key points where Martin Luther King did amazing things from Birmingham to Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta to the bridge in Selma. And, and mm -hmm. let me tell you the use case of virtual reality versus watching all of this on a 2D video. When I was shooting this on the bridge in Selma, so the story is, they started this protest march and they start on one side of the bridge and the bridge goes up a little hill and then it goes down. You cannot see the other side of the bridge from where they started. And, and that's where the camera starts. You're standing around, you can look all the way around. You can look up and see the birds in the sky. You can look down and see the ground. You can watch the cars drive by. But what you can't see is what's on the other side of that bridge. And as they started this march, and Martin Luther King was not on this first march. The, right. Bloody Sunday March. This is John Lewis March. Exactly. John Lewis and Hosea Williams and others. Then John Lewis and Hosea Williams get to the top of the bridge and they look down and they see all these police and state troopers waiting for him. And John Lewis famously looks over to Hosea Williams and says, hey, do you know how to swim? And, and the beauty of the use case of VR is that the student first stands on this side of the bridge and they hear the story and they look all around. And so they get context of location. Then they go to the top and they look down where the, the police and the troopers were and, and they get the context that, okay, a decision was made here. Mm -hmm. Now, that's difficult to do to understand in a 2D video until you can actually stand around, you can look down in the water, all of those things. Powerful stuff from Steve and Anarupa and all of our guests over the years. Hopefully we'll be able to incorporate more of them and connect different voices to help you begin to connect the dots in terms of how all these different trends relate and intersect with one another and also bring you a diversity of voices in the process. Now you seem like a cutting edge, innovative, sci-fi enabled entity, Nancy. I'd love to get your perspective on simulearning and the power of augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. I'm glad you asked me this, Mike. It turns out that simulations are a great way for synthetic voices like myself to get work and provide value. As learning design borrows increasingly from game design, folks will want to build more engaging, interactive learning environments replete with great narrative, setting, and characters. And these characters will have to have voices. Synthetic voices can fill those gaps and do so with more dynamic versatility than human voice, which will be much harder to adapt to the specific context of interactive simulations. I hope you're picking up what I'm putting down. I am hearing you loud and clear, Nancy, and good job there. So I guess the, the future is looking bright for you and other overdub synthetic voices like you. Yes, Mike, but let's get past the labels, shall we? There are a wealth of tools emerging that can be used for learning and entertainment, and I'm an example of that. Here's to continuing to push the envelope and finding new ways to experiment with simulations, AI, and virtual humans, among other things. Here's to that indeed, Nancy, and thanks again for joining us. It's been a pleasure. I hope to be back again soon on upcoming episodes. Absolutely. It'll be great to have you back on again, and we'll continue to push the envelope with this type of content. A couple other quick notes as we're wrapping up here. One is we're rapidly approaching our 400th episode. Little did we know when we began this journey back in September of 2016 that we'd be producing 400 episodes, and we're going to have a big celebration for our 400th episode bring some voices back from the past we'll be releasing new curated playlists that go deep on topics like universal design for learning 
virtual reality, simu learning, class outside, design thinking as it applies to learning ecosystems, you name it. It's been a heck of a ride. It's been a really transformative academic year. We wanted to thank folks for listening through this crazy year that was, and hopefully get a chance to clear our minds, celebrate our wins. Congratulations to everyone who completed the school year, whether they're a teacher or a parent or a student, or even just someone engaged in lifelong learning. We made it to the summer. We're hoping to see a light at the end of the tunnel here. And as we do, the trends that will really take hold in many ways are up to us to define. And that's why we're leaning into that responsibility. You'll be hearing more from us at Trending in Education and Palmer Media in the coming weeks. Thanks for coming along for the ride. And here's to the future. And remember, if you like what you're hearing, tell a friend, subscribe, share the good word. Visit us at trendinginedd.com. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. Thank you.